Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to another edition of this is Revolution Podcast. Sorry for the delay. I had a bit of a potty training emergency with my two-year-old Phoenix. It happens. It's real life on the show. Before we get to today's topic, I would like everyone to like and subscribe, hit the bell, and leave a comment. As you already know, we do read the comments. Also, if you have the means, support us on Patreon. Check out our This Is Revolution merch at www.thisisrevolutionpodcast.com. With Patreon, you do get access to the After Hours show and our Discourse server. And remember, when we get to a 1,000 patrons, we will be doing a live show somewhere in the West Coast. With that said, let me bring in my co-host, my homie, my dog, Mr. Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, peace and greetings Jason Miles. I would like to say, before we do anything, we mm-hmm. all have to get together and say, happy birthday <laughs> to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Day. I believe the 44th birthday of my man, my brother, my comrade, my good friend, Jason Miles. Thank you very much. And, uh, so we are happy for him. He's we're so happy that uh, as of next week, we're going to give him a vacation for a couple of weeks. Yes. And it's going to be me and a variety of other uh, co-hosts <laughs> holding the fort crew. down. Yes. And for my birthday, I did put out uh, two records. I was up till 3 a.m. making sure that all the shows went out for Friday, on the audio only podcast, and put out two records. So I'm very, very excited. There's two albums out. But before we bring in our guest, as you see, there's a backdrop of South Africa, a beautiful picture of Cape Town. Because I think when people think of South Africa, all they think about is town, townships in Soweto and people throwing rocks at tanks. There is a beautiful part of South Africa. But in this video, we're going to talk about the current situation. And with our guests, we're going to talk about the current situation that's going on right now with their now ousted president, Jacob Zuma. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. of South Africa, one of the great <coughs> cities of the Commonwealth. Johannesburg is planning for the f- for it is young, confident, vigorous, and rich. For under its very streets, a mile below, are the tunnels of vast gold. There are more Europeans here than anywhere else in Africa, and it is they who have built Johannesburg, but not without African labor. By law, Africans are to live in separate areas. This is apartheid, separation, South Africa's answer to the meeting of civilization and black Africa, the cup of the Nationalist Party of Prime Minister Johannes Stratum. But many do not believe in apartheid, and this is South Africa's greatest political issue. More than 300 years of white domination ended for good with the swearing in of Nelson Mandela as this African nation's first black president. So help me God. He was the most famous opponent of the brutal racist system of apartheid, imprisoned 27 years. Today, Mandela paid tribute to his new vice president, F.W. de Klerk, the last apartheid president who negotiated the historic transfer of power. 
Mandela then called for unity in this racially diverse and racially divided land. What are the roots of the current political crisis in South Africa? Why has the ending of apartheid not resolved the economic gulf that exists between racial and class groups? What is the path forward to resolve the economic challenge in this once racially segregated nation? We'll ask these questions and more. This is Revolution. Under fire from all sides, Jacob Zuma faced an expectant nation tonight, and nobody watching knew what he was going to say. I have therefore come to the decision to resign as President of the Republic with immediate effect. His resignation brings to an end an exhaustive debacle that has strained the political system here. Zuma's been negotiating with his successor, trying to hang on. Indeed, his defiance lasted right up until this afternoon when he used another television appearance to play the victim. There's nothing I've done wrong. This is policy. What, what, what people are suggesting is a new, the new thing, the new phenomenon. What is the problem? I don't understand. The answer to the question why his party wants him out came, at least in part, in the form of a police raid in Johannesburg this morning. Three arrests were made in the home of a prominent business family associated with corruption allegations faced by President Zuma. This is him with one of the Gupta brothers. Mr. Zuma is suspected of giving them favored access to government contracts. Both Mr. Zuma and the Guptas deny any wrongdoing, but many South Africans feel this crackdown was a long time coming. Can you hear me? I can hear you, brother. All right, let's bring in our guest. Milton Alamani attended the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia for an MS degree. He won the prestigious James Weschler Memorial Prize Award in International Journalism at Columbia. He has an MA and bachelor's degree in economics from Syracuse. Did you know that, Pascal? Yes, I did. I knew about Syracuse. He uh, started his journalism career with internships at the Journal of Commerce and the Wall Street Journal. He was a freelance reporter for the New York Times. We're actually going to have some interesting stories about his time with the Times. Uh, a reporter and deputy managing editor with Sun City before founding Black Star News. Please welcome... Mr. Milton Alamadi. Oh, thank you so much, comrades, for that wonderful introduction. I'm no always proud to be on your show. Thank you for okay. having me. Milton, we, uh, we know you have a new book out to promote, and we will get to the book. We'll talk about that perhaps in the uh, second half of the show. Sure. But for now, we will talk about what is going on in South Africa. Right. And if you don't and, mind, Pascal, I wanted to ask the first question, if you don't mind. Oh, no problem. <laughs> you, you know, it, this, for my birthday, all I wanted to do. your birthday, no problem. Oh, we, we could toss a coin. <laughs> <laughs> so Pascal and I were watching a lot of, lot of videos, uh, news reports from around the world. Um, there actually wasn't much American news about this whatsoever. Um, and also reading as much as we could about the current situation right. with the crazy rioting and looting. And some people are calling it protesting. Other people are calling it looting. Right. And some of the better interviews that I saw where they had panel discussions, where they were a little more broad based with, with more than just uh, ANC people talking. Um, they centered it with kind of the fall of apartheid and the Mandela government, that a lot of these economic problems uh, start there and never really got resolved during his administration. Right. Where would you start with, like, if someone said, what's going on and where were these economic problems really stem from? What would you say? I would say 
the demands are finally being made uh, for income redistribution, mm -hmm. for a change of control over the uh, uh, means of production, uh, control over the uh, the major resources, which in South Africa, of course, happens to be the mines mm -hmm. and the land. And I think as progressively, uh, as a result of the uh, COVID pandemic and the pressure that that has put on the, um, the South African population, the African population, the demands are becoming much more uh, strident, uh, much more bold. So when you uh, people talk about rioting as opposed to or versus uprising, mm -hmm. there's, an, there's an element of both. Uh, the conditions would warrant what we are seeing today in South Africa. I think uh, the arrest of Zuma just happened to be a convenient spark. Gotcha. But sooner or later, it would have erupted because the economics, the, the statistics alone uh, bear this out. Unemployment in South Africa is 33%. Mm -hmm. uh, black unemployment is around 38%. Mm -hmm. Youth unemployment, and of course, the majority of the population is very young, like most of Africa, is 40 plus percent. Mm -hmm. The situation is completely unsustainable. And then in terms of income inequity, wealth inequity, mm -hmm. South Africa, supposedly it's even worse than in the United States. Oh, I, did to believe. I did see I did see something about uh, uh, the economic inequity being what is, what is the genie? Right. Yes. And, and, and that's difficult for people to understand that. But I think if we uh, use a, a simpler narrative like income, uh, wealth, uh, control of the wealth, 10% uh, of the richest South Africans control about 85% of the uh, uh, household income in South Africa. It's just completely unsustainable. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that we have not seen this kind of upheaval even earlier. And I'm willing to bet we are going to see uh, more of these types of uh, uh, upheavals. Something else will spark it. And eventually South Africa is going to have to um, really come to the truth and do what needs to be done. Steve Biko, before mm -hmm. he was murdered brutally, uh, at the age of only uh, 30 in 1977, had predicted this. Uh, there's an interesting interview, and people can locate it on YouTube, just put interview with Steve Biko, and it's about a 25-minute interview. And the most interesting thing he says in that interview is that if at the end of the day, we just replace the white rulers with black rulers, and we don't fundamentally restructure the economy of South Africa, if we don't uh, nationalize the mines, the major banks, um, if we don't redistribute income, then it's going to be the same. It's going to be as if nothing has changed. <laughs> and, uh, the, and Biko was absolutely 100% right. That's exactly what's happened in South Africa. Uh, the European political leadership has been replaced by African political leadership, but the economic structure remains the same. And then the uh, final point, the land. Land is at the heart of the resistance against apartheid in mm -hmm. South Africa. It's not like they did not like Europeans. They did not like the exploitation. That's why they fought against apartheid and they wanted the land. So now, 27 years after the end of apartheid, the European population is about 9%, and yet they control 72% of the land. It is outrageous. It is outrageous. In fact, if Africans in South Africa were not really decent people, mm -hmm. it would not happen. 
reverse the equation. You have Africans coming to Europe, coming to Britain, committing massacres, taking over the land. And then centuries later, the British are able to push the African minority in Britain out of power and end African apartheid in Britain. Do you think we would be talking 27 years later, waiting for the land to be returned to the rightful owners? It's only in an African setting where mm -hmm. people are basically decent to the core. And then that's the, 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 why it's so infuriating when Africans are maligned, abused, uh, ridiculed, demonized, when in fact they are so decent. People are dying, yearning for land. They need the land. They need mm -hmm. jobs. Mm -hmm. Yet they tolerate living next to white opulence without taking any drastic actions. People should be asking, why are they not attacking uh, white wealth as opposed to, uh, to attacking those uh, uh, urban uh, shopping malls uh, to get these commodities and resources? Mm -hmm. They're not attacking white people physically and saying, yeah. Our condition is because you are monopolizing the wealth. They're not even doing that. No, <laughs> you know. So yeah. to me, uh, uh, attacking those malls and taking those, uh, whether you call it looting or not, mm -hmm. uh, that is not the worst thing that could be happening in South Africa. If you look at the history and you look at the objective conditions. Milton, I would like to, uh, Jason, you want to, yeah, if you want to no, follow no, up? No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Milton, one of uh, my fondest memories of uh, our mutual friend and comrade, Glenn Ford, was at the Left Forum in 2013, when I was uh, early in my writing uh, uh, relationship with Black Agenda Report. And the, the subject at the Left Forum was on South, on South Africa. And Glenn Ford gave one of the most scathing analysis of what happened with Nelson Mandela and his role in structuring the agreement that he came to that launched his presidency into what would become post-apartheid South Africa right. in a way that for someone like myself who only heard rumors about this was shocking. And I immediately followed up with research and I was like, there is a reason that Mandela is held up as such a hero. And I did research on my own. And I found out that Winnie Mandela, before she died, she right. basically created the image that Mandela was somewhat of a traitor, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. I would like you, as a uh, brother of the African continent, who was familiar with this history, can right. you elaborate for us on if there, if Mandela has hands on the problem that we have here? Since we know that part of the ANC platform before Mandela's release was land reform and land repatriation. Right. Well, I look at it yeah, in, a, in a holistic way. Mm -hmm. Am I disappointed that uh, the new dispensation did not yield a lot more to the African majority? Yes, absolutely, 100%. But I would not go as far as to call Mandela a traitor, considering the, the sacrifice and contribution that he made to the liberation struggle. Uh, people don't know the whole Mandela, so it's worth going back a little bit of the history. Mandela uh, was trained as a lawyer and he became a part of the African National Congress. When they were agitating for change using um, nonviolence, and they tried the nonviolence approach for decades. If you look back, uh, many people probably don't even know the name. Uh, uh, people like Sobukwe, Robert Sobukwe. Robert Sobukwe was also a part of uh, the ANC initially. Mm -hmm. But then he parted ways because he said he wanted uh, the movement to be, 
the membership to be exclusively African. He thought by having a multi-racial, multinational organization, it would sort of uh, dissipate or dilute the demands that the African population was making. And he said, ultimately, they were the ones who were bearing the brunt of the apartheid exploitation. Um, so that is why he founded the uh, Pan-Africanist Congress, the PAC. Mandela continued with the ANC. But then after the, uh, the uh, Sharpeville massacre, it became quite obvious that this nonviolent approach was not the solution. So what did Mandela do? Mandela trained to begin armed resistance. And he went to Ethiopia, he was trained by the Ethiopian military. And then he went to Algeria, where he trained together with the FNL, who were fighting against French uh, imperialism and had already virtually won. They were consolidating their hold of uh, Algeria. So they trained him in guerrilla uh, warfare, in combat, in sabotage. And uh, he came back to South Africa and he started this campaign of sabotage, bombing uh, government buildings and other institutions. Ultimately, he was betrayed by uh, the good old CIA of the United States. They gave the South African intelligence the tip of where Mandela was uh, hiding out. And that's how he was arrested and eventually tried uh, and convicted and given the, uh, the life sentence. And uh, he served a total of 27 years. And uh, in 1990, by the time he was released, he was an elderly individual. But the global resistance against apartheid had uh, galvanized around Mandela in all these uh, decades of his incarceration. So obviously, uh, it means that South Africans recognize the role that he played before he was arrested. And that role carried through even after he was arrested. They could have replaced him with somebody who was not incarcerated to become the new leader of the ANC and have that individual uh, uh, pursue the end of apartheid in a different way, if they thought that could be a better approach. But we also have to remember the tremendous pressure under which Mandela uh, uh, was, 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 was fighting. Mandela was not fighting only the white apartheid regime. Mandela was fighting the full might of the Western world. The United States, uh, Britain, all those European powers were essentially on the side of the apartheid white minority racist regime. They were not going to allow any dispensation that would involve the fundamental restructuring of the economy, wealth and income uh, redistribution, change in the ownerships of the mines, the major mines and other um, uh, of the major resources in South Africa. So that is what Mandela was, uh, was negotiating with. The alternative, of course, would have been for him to say, no, I don't want to be a part of this. I do not want to be released, I released and let the ANC uh, uh, fight an armed uh, until they bring the apartheid regime of many African countries have also been punished heavily by the South African military, by the United States, uh, the ANC would have hardly been in a position to wage an armed combat uh, until uh, the apartheid regime was brought to its knees. So we have to look at the uh, reality on the ground that Mandela was dealing with. It's not that Mandela who sacrificed so much <laughs> should suddenly after 27 years say, uh, you know what? 
I'm just ready to take anything. If he had been a sellout, he would not have lasted 27 years behind bars. After five years, he might have said, this is enough for me. That's how I see it. So we have to look at it at the totality. And let's not forget, Mandela would not have been released in 1990 had it not been for Cuba. Cuba. I was about to ask you about that. Yeah. Yes. When Cuba dealt the apartheid military a decisive defeat in Angola, only then did the apartheid regime and its Western supporters realize that this system could actually be brought to its knees by armed resistance, but it would take Cuban involvement. Because had it not been for Cuba, first of all, Angola would have uh, ended up being controlled by that reactionary, Jonas Savimbi of UNITA, who was, of course, backed by the CIA and the South African uh, military. So what Cuba did was actually uh, ensure the independence of Angola, uh, 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 create the independence of Namibia, because as soon as South Africa withdrew <laughs> after the defeat, it also uh, ended its occupation of uh, Namibia. And Namibia became independent in 1990. Mandela was released the same year. The election was 1994, and he became the first African president. So that was the equation. Until Unless Cuba and Castro was willing to say, listen, mm -hmm. let's go all the way. Let's follow them all the way to South Africa. But then I wonder whether the West would have allowed that to happen. <laughs> they might have uh, uh, decided that it's time to go back uh, and invade Cuba again. Because mind you, Cuba did not even tell its main sponsor, the uh, former Soviet Union, which is today Russia, that it was making deployment of uh, about 30,000 troops uh, into Angola. It came as a surprise as uh, uh, to the Soviet Union as well, because the Soviets were trying to mend relations with the United States, you know? What part of white flight also really hurt the Mandela administration? Because as he comes into power, uh, you also have uh, an exodus of a lot of the middle-class white population and well-to-do white population. Well, surely that was on his mind as well because he saw what happened uh, to, uh, to Zimbabwe. And obviously he did not want that to happen to South Africa. Yeah, he knows, he knew uh, uh, to what extent they could essentially shut down that economy, an economy which is uh, completely intertwined uh, and linked with the uh, with Western uh, finance uh, capital. With and the that diamond mines and the, and the gold exactly. mines. And of the course, gold. absolutely. And, and of course, Western tourism is a huge industry in South Africa. Absolutely. But the mines are, are really the, the key thing. Uh, the mines, um, uh, shareholders, European shareholders, American shareholders um, all over the world. So it's Elon Musk that system so milton i want to ask you yes how would you objectively analyze the role of its of the anc as a party is its stewardship of uh the political reality in south africa right uh is there i wouldn't say corruption but is there a a class tension with the ANC. Well, well, why is corruption a bad word? And I just I just asked a question yep. because apparently during the Zuma administration, allegedly yep. he's supposed to have uh funneled 35 billion with a B dollars. And they live rather lap it, it, it's it's kind of a yeah, thing yeah. that people talk about you you're black, get into politics. Yep, absolutely. No, I, I mean, continue with the question, but yes, corruption. <laughs> no, well, I, I'm not, I, I don't have a problem with the, I have no problem with the corruption uh, assessment as well. I wasn't going to yeah, go. I, only have yeah. one, uh, I have one thing I like to interject here with that uh, corruption, and perhaps that's something that you also feel uncomfortable about. Mm -hmm. Because normally when they talk about corruption, they make it appear as if this is something that is endemic to Africa and African countries. And we forget the corruption in the United States, perhaps. Yeah the most corrupt country, you know, yeah. in the world, you know, who can beat the corruption on Wall Street, right? So that's sometimes when they have this sanctimonious um, 
uh, reference to corruption in Africa. You know, that's where I, I have my beef. But yes, these uh, uh, African elite are essentially partners of their European counterparts. And of course, uh, as, they, as they say, it takes two uh, to tango. So the corruption is a two-way street. The African uh, elite in South Africa, and not only in South Africa, in every African country, mm -hmm. with their European uh, counterparts. And when I say Europeans, and then somebody just posted comprados, exactly, mm -hmm. that's the way to refer to them. You know, and that is a, that, that actually is the crisis right now. Uh, South Africa, the story of South Africa is revolution delayed. And I encourage everybody listening who's not familiar with Steve Biko, please understand this brother. Listen to anything on YouTube where Steve Biko is actually opening his mouth and speaking. <laughs> Read anything that was ever written by Steve Biko. Side, how did you feel about that movie that came out in the late 80s with uh, Kevin Klein and Denzel Washington, Cry Freedom? Do you remember that movie? Yes, I do. I think it was a, it was it was pretty good you know, compared to um, to be uh, having nothing else, you know, before that. Yes, uh, and there are a few documentaries also on YouTube that people should uh, look at and read his book. I write what I like, where he discusses his own evolution as well. Um, it reminds me of uh, Asata. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, I wanted to read that book for a long time. Uh, I have to confess I never read it, and I'm just now reading it. And I also want to plug that. Anybody who's not yet read Asata, <laughs> you're not complete. Oh, this is a very good question. Can you talk about the role of uh, South Africa's South Asian community or Indian community? You want to talk about District 6? Yes. And in fact... It's interesting that you should uh, you should uh, you should bring that because if you look at the uh, you you also actually brought up the uh, issue of the class uh, the class segmentation and class struggle in South Africa. So you have a lot of poor white folks as well, you know, and a lot of poor Indians as well. So the looting that you saw on CNN or BBC or what have you, you only saw Africans. But poor Europeans were also looting in South Africa. Poor Indians were also looting in, uh, in South Africa. And we have a, a, a writer based in Zimbabwe who writes for us. So he was covering that aspect uh, for Black Star News. So we have a few stories about that on Black Star News. But then you also have uh, uh, the more than 200 people were killed during the uprising slash looting. Not all of them were killed by the South African security forces. Many of them were killed by white militias who were heavily, heavily armed. <laughs> heavily yeah. armed. Yes. They still have a big presence within the uh, South African security forces, you know, and basically they they're, 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 they're a good segment of European South Africans who still crave uh, for a reversion, a retrogression, thinking they can still go back to the apartheid era where Europeans control not only the economy, uh, but the uh, politics as well. And South Africa is actually in a dangerous position right now. Because if you have a division uh, within the ruling African elite, that, of course, uh, is going to incentivize uh, the reactionary Europeans. And you can say, just because uh, Africans have the numeric uh, demographic uh, uh, superiority that they should not, they should feel comfortable because of that. Uh, absolutely not, because the Europeans uh, still actually hold most of the weapons. And that is why they were actually able to, to impose their rule over the African majority 
uh, for almost uh, 50 years officially after apartheid was created in 48 and for centuries before that it's always been about who controls the superior weapons and right now in south africa um europeans still still do of course the only thing that they're conscious of is the diplomatic backlash even the most reactionary african countries i think if the europeans were to seize power military power uh, because they've had this conversation for a long time mm -hmm. having a white led coup d'etat in south africa even the most reactionary african countries uh, would not stand for it and they would definitely deploy and uh, and invade uh, south africa so they're not going to go back to where europeans control both the politics and the economy but right now i mean the controlling the economy has been working so well for them and uh, that still needs to be addressed milton i want to ask you a question from a perspective of someone who ancestrally comes from a historically black run country if you will yeah. uh, dealing with imperialism and whatnot right these these issues that we're talking about the comprador elite yes the uh black the black uh, uh the national bourgeoisie yes people like fanon warned about this yes uh people from uh amilcar cabral Yes, mm -hmm. warned about this. Walter that Martin. basically, after the liberation struggles, yes. they realized that there would arise a class of black compradors mm -hmm. who would become the managers of the politics of these nations and countries. Yes. And they would be nothing but basically black faces on the same politics that ma maintain the suffering of the larger communities right that exist prop up right. the system right now i would argue that we see that we've seen that in definitely seen that in haiti yep, we've seen yeah. that throughout the african continent right can you explain to me milton yes what do you think is the obstacle for our brothers and sisters in america that are black to not realize that the same phenomenon is happening in them to here happening to them here in the United States. Right, because the outlets, of course, I mean, the corporate media really um, uh, dominates this and in terms of disseminating this false narrative. So you don't mm -hmm. have analysis uh, where people actually understand history and the history of class struggle, uh, segmentation and all that. So, it's really difficult if you don't have uh, at least some element of theoretical grounding. You can know that things are bad and you wonder, you know, what do you do? You uh, can um, voice your outrage by protesting. Uh, you can be, uh, you know, reactionary by just, uh, you know, becoming, uh, engaging in petty crimes. Uh, you can become disillusioned and just give up. I think what was the beauty of the Black Panthers in the 60s was that, uh, you know, these young sisters and brothers were actually reading <laughs> and they were tying the struggle, the domestic struggle to the global resistance against capital and imperialism. That is why they were so dangerous. And that is why they were not allowed to survive. Mm -hmm. Because when you start teaching uh, young people, uh, even before they're in high school, they understand uh, the role of capital in their uh, condition of being exploited. That is truly the beginning of uh, leading people to a change, uh, toward creating a different type of society in the United States or anywhere in the world. So that lack of, uh, of, uh, of uh, analysis uh, that is not uh, only a problem here in the United States. It's also a problem in most of these countries, whether it's Haiti. You know, Haiti, I, I, I keep saying Haiti is uh, an African country in the Western Hemisphere. And well, whether it's uh, in the uh, continental Africa, it's the same thing. The kind of uh, the universities that used to turn out uh, these uh, young folks like Steve Biko, 
who were really on top of the game, able to analyze because they had they had uh, in the University of in Tanzania they had teachers like Walter Rodney, you see, who was not only teaching the theory, but was actually going down to the ground and interacting with the regular folks and breaking it down to them so they would understand uh, the importance of engaging against uh, capital while also enlightening yourself. So we're really missing that. We're missing that, but I'm hopeful because now with the internet, we can create this kind of platform that we have here. We can have these kind of discussions and we need to have more of these kind of discussions, more of these kind of platforms in Africa as well. Um, recently, I've been doing a lot of writing about the role of the IMF and the World Bank in sustaining the Museveni regime in Uganda. You know, this US puppet who's been in power uh, for 35 years now. So I'm essentially telling people, and Ugandans are now actually more and more relating to it. I say, yes, Museveni is, you can see him as the enemy domestically, but who gives him the weapons? He does not, Uganda does not manufacture any weapons. Who trains his army? and who gives, gives him the loan so that he doesn't have to uh, uh, address the, the, uh, the demands of the local population. Why does he have to care about what Ugandans say when he's going to get a check from the IMF for $1 billion? Last year, uh, he got 491 million from the IMF and 300 million from the World Bank. And there are clear reports that a lot of the money was embezzled to his generals so they could suppress, um, which of course uh, helped to steal the election earlier this year in January uh, from Bobby Wine. And yet, even though the IMF and World Bank know this, they still give him another loan for $1 billion in June, which is clear proof that the IMF and World Bank are not really there to, uh, uh, to address issues of economic development in African countries. Nonsense. That's not the case. If that is the case, you would not want a corrupt individual as the president of a country. You would promote uh, people you know are not corrupt, uh, people who have a clear platform. You would support them. But then, of course, if you support people like that, then that's when you really see a change happening. Because people like that would say, first of all, when you give us loans, why are you saying that we should remove subsidies from education? Mm -hmm. We should remove subsidies from, from health care. So now that people, people now die of diseases that are easily treatable, including malaria, because they can't go to uh, the uh, dispensary or clinics for free now. And when you give us those loans, why are you... Um, um, uh, exempting us or precluding us from industrializing. You know, it's not um, on most of the countries that industrialize, uh, except for us, which was uh, one of the earlier first to industrialize uh, from 1760 to 1840. Mm -hmm. Most countries industrialize uh, toward the 20th century. Countries like uh, uh, Russia, uh, formerly Soviet Union, industrialized. In the 20th century, at the time of the uh, revolution, 1917, it was one of the most backward economies. Yeah, you know, An agrarian economy. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But Africa was prevented because the technology was denied to Africa because during that time, they were still colonized up till the 1960s. But even up today, they're still denied uh, the technology to industrialize because they continue exporting raw materials. Mm -hmm. And you buy cars and electronic equipment, uh, pharmaceutical from the country that already industrialized because it's going to be too costly for you. Oh, was was that it? Was that it? Well, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, uh, brother Alamadi. Was was then is that a failure of some of these governments to to really open the door to neoliberalism and privatize all these areas of the economy, especially a place like South Africa? I believe there is private health care. Their version of charter schools, uh, 
it's pretty much a, a playground for neoliberalism. And I don't think there's any yeah. uh, black African ownership of those mines. I think that's all Absolutely. from the historic uh, oligarchical uh, white families. Absolutely. And they bring in people like, like uh, um, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, who is the president now, mm -hmm. uh, to bite a little bit, a chunk of that well. Remember, he was uh, a member of the board of these major mining companies that went out and shot workers who were demanding uh, better wages, you know? So they appeased a few of them as they, in fact, <laughs> uh, now that I say this, that's exactly what Biko said in that interview that I referred to. He said, now and then they will bring a few of the black folks and allow them to enter into the petty bourgeoisie or the bourgeoisie elite. And that's exactly what's happened. Uh, it's it's really, you know, it's 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 really painful when you know that, you know, there were conscious Africans that knew that this is exactly what was going to follow, like um, Kwame Nkrumah, mm -hmm. and people that have not read his book, uh, Imperialism: The Last Stage. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Neocolonialism: The Last Stage of Imperialism. If yeah. people don't have the time to order the book, you can read the introduction, which is available online. So you can just Google introduction uh, to neocolonialism, last stage of imperialism, and it'll just pop up on Google and read those 12 pages. And he breaks it down completely. He's covering everything that we're discussing right now, essentially saying these uh, former colonials are going to continue wanting our materials, our wealth, and they're going to do anything to continue having access, either overthrowing an African government, getting another African country to undermine other African countries who want to break from that neocolonial camp, or by using finances, you know? Mm. And of course, nowadays, that's exactly what they do. They use the World Bank and the IMF. And if you have African leaders who are not serious in really intervening and saying, I'm not out here to make a few million dollars for myself. You know, you need to have a person like a Thomas Sankara, you know, mm. and I think people have already uh, uh, posted his name on the chat, who is willing to say, it's not about me, it's about my people. Then you can really see how political power can really lead to fundamental change in African countries. Museveni has been in power for 35 years, has taken Uganda backward. Thomas Sankara was in power for four years. He took Burkina Faso to a place that the people in that country never believed to be able to take them. Uh, food sufficiency within three years. But most importantly, lifting their, uh, their consciousness and giving them the confidence that they can do for themselves building their own rural hospitals, building their own rural schools, uh, planting uh, uh, trees to stop deforestation when uh, not even most European people are talking about uh, global warming and all that stuff. That was one African leader. And then he said, we need to remove the debt that's holding us back. That's really when he got into trouble with exactly. France and the trouble. Western powers, right? right. But I, I wanted to ask you, if we had 10 Thomas Sankaras, not even 50, 10 would be enough, really, because 10 would force the African population in countries where you have the most reactionary presidents to get rid of them. And then ultimately, you start seeing unions of regional countries coming together, you know, because it takes only one person with a reactionary agenda to push everything backward. You know, you in you in East Africa, you have Kenya. Yeah, Kenya is uh, a hotbed of capital, but Kenya is also progressive in the sense that many Kenyans are very conscious and well educated, and they could see the benefit of forming a union with Tanzania, and then with Uganda, to increase in, increase your global bargaining position. But when you have a reactionary like uh, the president in Uganda, that's not going to happen, you know? He does everything that is to please the West, 
I'll give you the latest example. Now, he's offered to take uh, 2,000 refugees from Afghanistan, and that is fine. You know, people fleeing conflict uh, need accommodation. And now he gets some media play on the corporate media headlines. Now, he's taking refugees uh, from Afghanistan to show them hospitality, while at the same time he's killing Ugandans. <laughs> And this has been covered by all the corporate media, the BBC, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Al Jazeera, The Guardian, all of them have been covering this campaign. That's escalating since January after he stole the elections. Young people are being kidnapped from the streets because he wants to preempt a potential popular uprising. So young people are just randomly picked from the streets or picked from their home, away from their parents or family, and they're tortured and some of them are found dead. Many articles about that. But now you get this, oh, no, now some of the spin in the media is going to be say, oh, look at this, uh, uh, this very hospitable African leader who is willing to take uh, 2,000 refugees, when in fact he's just doing it to divert attention from the atrocities that he's committing uh, in Uganda. We're coming up on the last five minutes, but I wanted to get you, if you can, to speak on the economic freedom fighters yes. and also the the Pan Africanist Pan Africanist Congress of Anzania and right. their role in this situation. I don't think we can have this show on South Africa and not talk about those institutions. Okay, I think the PAC unfortunately has not recovered uh, uh, since the. Uh, uh, the killing, really, of uh, Robert uh, Sobukwe. Uh, he was killed by the apartheid regime. Uh, first, he was imprisoned, and uh, his health deteriorated while he was in prison, and then he was under house arrest uh, for many years. So even though it's reported that eventually he died from TB or what have you, it was a killing because he was not treated for a long time, and they wanted him to die. And sadly, uh, his party has never recovered. He was uh, really up there on the level of uh, Mandela. And obviously they wanted to make sure uh, that he died, uh, that people like uh, Biko died, because these might have been uh, the alternatives uh, uh, to, uh, to, to Mandela. Uh, but the economic freedom fighters, yes, that uh, party keeps growing. It's a party that is supported by the youth in South Africa. It's a party that of course is also maligned by major corporate media. Uh, because uh, they sense that the uh, power structure would be uh, fundamentally changed uh, were they to really come into power. In fact, the ANC never mentioned the land issue until the economic freedom fighters started demanding uh, seize the land without compensation. <laughs> you yeah. know, and that just you know that just that call went viral all over South Africa. So the ANC was supposed to now also start talking about, yes, uh, uh, return the land uh, uh, without uh, having to pay for it. But so let me ask you a question, because we often hear in Africa the seize the land language in these countries that had white minorities. And right. one of the things that the capitalists or the colonialists or the white, the quote unquote white supremacists always use, and they ask this question, is that how are these Africans going to be able to maintain this land and make it exactly. beneficial or profitable exactly. without our technology and know how? Especially when they don't understand how to work said technology. Right. Thank, right? You. Thank you for asking that question. Number one, in Zimbabwe, Perfect. Great. Great. where the African population controlled only about 10% of the land, they were producing about 70% of the food. <laughs> about that. But of course, this is not in the interest of a publication of New York Times or BBC to let the world know about that. That's number one. Number two, the Africans who actually became commercial farmers and the ones who had access to some capital, they were as productive or even more productive than European Zimbabweans. And if you read, if people do research carefully, you'll find at least two or three stories about this in the New York Times, out of hundreds of stories talking about how Africans were failures. 
It's all Someone nonsense. wants to... It's all nonsense. How can you say Africans were a failure when Africans were farming before Europeans were farming? <laughs> Someone wanted to ask, would you consider the uh, economic freedom fighters leftists? Or is this black capitalism in in uh in radical chic terms? Okay, they if I uh, believe in the language that they uh, that they uh, that they talk, then I would say uh, they're leftists. I think obviously, uh, uh, but. the ANC was also considered to be very progressive until they came into power. So I think the test is still down the line. You know, mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's easier for the talk. And then once you get into but they power, got the berets and everything. That's right. why I was like, well, listen, we got two minutes left. We got two minutes left. The beret can disappear very quickly. <laughs> we, we have obviously we hope, we hope it does not, but I'm just you know saying yeah. we have two minutes left, but we'll probably go an extra three minutes to go um uh, an hour or five. In this last few minutes, Milton, tell us yeah. about your book. What is the premise of your book? And what are you? What is the thesis that you're trying to get across? Okay, very good. Demonization of African people has always gone hand in hand with exploitation. Whether it was slavery and enslavement, you had to rationalize enslaving African people, human beings. You have to convince Europeans that these were not really human beings like us, meaning Europeans. So that's where the literature of demonization kept evolving demonization during colonialism. These are backward people who are in need of European civilization, you know? So demonization went hand in hand. So what I did in this book, I went back to the, started with the writings of the so-called explorers who were basically agents of imperialism sent to map out Africa where the resources are. But they disseminated the initial literature that demonized Africans. If you read the literature written by people like uh, Samuel Baker in the, um, in the 18th century, uh, describing a way he says that um, Africans should not be compared to the noble character of the dog, you know? But at the same time, the true essence of what he's advocating comes through in the same book, where it says we need to force them to buy European products and exchange it with products from Africa. And the same template creating by, created by these so-called explorers who renamed African countries, rivers, lakes, uh, and give, gave them European names. You know, we have Lake Victoria in Uganda. We have, you know, <laughs> all the, all, uh, Victoria Falls in uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia and all that nonsense. They created a template that was then later on used by writers that were sent, uh, for example, from the United States, from the New York Times, uh, National Geographic, Time Magazine, and in more recent years, the New Yorker. So you still find this element of demonizing Africans. And all of it, of course, is to justify the exploitation of Africa up to today in the contemporary uh, uh, era. So for example, I'll give you just one quick anecdote. Mm. When the New York Times sent a reporter named Homer Bigart to cover uh, decolonization in Africa, first he went to Ghana. And then he wrote a letter to his foreign editor here in New York saying, I cannot get enthusiastic about these so-called emerging republics. The leaders are mystics. Uh, I prefer the primitive Bush people <laughs> because uh, cannibalism is the best antidote to the population explosion that everybody's complaining about. Yeah. So then you, you say, this is a deranged racist reporter, perhaps. So I said, let me go and see the articles that were actually published in the New York Times. And there's a perfect correlation between the articles in one instance, he said he wanted to interview pygmies about what independence meant to them in the Congo. And he complained in this letter that he was not able to find them. By the time his article was published in the New York Times, he's quoting pygmies now saying, oh, independent means we're gonna have more beer, more salt. So in other words, trivializing this momentous uh, occasion in Africa of decolonization. And then just one final example, I know we're out of time. This is the best letter I found. I found a letter by a reporter named William, um, no, he's, he's a descendant of William Lloyd Garrison, the abolitionist, but his name was Lloyd Garrison. And he covered the Biafra, the civil war in Nigeria. He wrote a letter to his editor demanding to know who inserted this scene into his article. 
he didn't write about it and then he read it and then he read about the scene and what was that scene nigerians dressed in grass leaves so editors of the new york times just made this up and inserted it into the news article published in the new york times so this was very malicious so the title of the book is manufacturing hate how africa was demonized in western media by our guest milton alemadi who is a friend of the show who we will definitely have back on because he always brings the most fascinating incredible nuanced perspectives on what is going on in the african continent milton we'd like to ask you if it's possible can you give us at least a half hour maybe longer on the patrons section where we have our patrons come in and we actually talk about extending further the topic of the conversation is that possible for you oh, i can do i can do half an hour for sure definitely got him we got him thank you we we have a we have a super chat. Can we get this, Jason? Can we do this last super chat? Uh, props to the new. Thank you very much. Uh, can y'all ask Milton about the left wing S A F T U Union Federation versus the C O S A T U, which played a larger role in last year's general strike? Uh, in South Africa, Kwasato mm -hmm. has so far been uh, the most effective union in South Africa historically. Uh, from the era of the resistance struggle. Uh, obviously, it was like a, uh, a conglomeration of all the unions that existed at that time. But most of the unions are now under a lot of pressure in South Africa, pressure coming from the establishment, from the leadership, uh, from uh, Cyril Ramaphosa himself. Uh, before he became president, uh, he, um, he uh, supported uh, union busting. Uh, by the police and by the armed forces, where union leaders were actually physically attacked and a few were actually taken out. So unions are under a lot of tremendous pressure in South Africa, all the unions, in fact, as a result of that. Interesting. Well, thank you, uh, Brother Alamadi, for coming on the show. Thank you, Pascal. For being Milton, what is your Twitter? Can you announce your Twitter for the other people asking what your Twitter handle is? Oh, yes. I'm at Alimadi. At Alimadi is Milton on Twitter. Yes. Praise on break. Facebook. <laughs> and, and, and now they call it Praise Break when we go to the next event. I put links in the description wherever you're listening or watching the show uh, to Milton's book and definitely in the chat, uh, M. Toussaint. Definitely put a bunch of uh, there it is right again another link in the uh, in the chat right. uh, to get Milton's latest book, which I was very hurt I couldn't get uh, online like a digital copy ebook. E there you go. That's what you young people call it. Oh, <laughs> oh, you couldn't get it from the publisher's website either. That's crazy. I keep telling uh, them. Yeah, I was I was hurt. I was really hurt. Because I was like, I don't have time to over. I couldn't get I got to overnight it, but I'm getting it anyway. So, Pascal, you ready to go? I'm ready to rock and roll. Thank you guys very much. If you haven't done it, please like and subscribe. If you can and you want to see this bonus half along with all the other bonus half, and since you guys requested it, and as the show is getting better, I bought an extra hard drive. All the bonus half patron content is audio only for patrons as well. We also have the Mau Mau Hour with Pascal Robert once a month. We have other shows that we do just for patrons. Do it. You ready? Ready. Okay. And we are out. <laughs>